Hello. Today on Learning the Social Sciences, we are covering militarism in Japan, 1919 to 1941. So we have to go back to the Meiji Restoration to really start talking about the rise of militarism in Japan. And with this, it always correlates to the rise of imperialism. So of course, the Western powers went out and started to colonize Africa and parts of Asia after they went through the Industrial Revolution. Japan had the United States visit them with four Navy boats in 1853, thus opening up Japan to the outside world after being closed off for 220 years due to the Tokugawa isolationist policies. Now, when they opened up, they quickly studied the outside world and they were seeing what was going on in China with Britain and other nations exerting their power in that country and China losing out. Japan then sent people to Europe to be trained and then to implement what they have learned there in Japan to industrialize their nation, to reform the military, to bring in new military tactics, to actually bring in a new constitution and create a constitutional monarchy based off of what they had in the German Empire and to start a school education system for all for at least elementary. So the nation industrialized quickly because they didn't have to go and invent everything. All they had to do was implement. And it's a lot faster to copy and paste than, the, than to have to write everything from the start. And so Japan went and showed itself twice at the turn of the century about how this industrialization had worked. In the late 1800s, they beat China in the Sino-Japanese War, what will be turning out to be the first Sino-Japanese War. And then they beat Russia in the Russo-Japanese War that started in 1904 and ended in 1905, thus establishing themselves as an imperialist power. So in 1910, Japan formally annexed the Korean Peninsula, which they then took over, over during that Sino-Japanese War. Um, the Japanese-Korean Annexation Treaty was signed by representatives of the Empire of Japan and the Korean Empire on August 22, 1910. But the Japanese colonial rule in Korea was harsh. For the first 10 years, Japan ruled directly through the military and any Korean descent was ruthlessly crushed. Korea, though, rose up in protest against the Japanese uh, starting March 1st, 1919, and eventually the Japanese will relax somewhat uh, their harsh, harsh policies due to these protests, and they will allow a limited degree of freedom of expression, but still the treatment and what is going on in Korea is something that we would still classify as ruthless. Now, what is going on with Japan 1918 after World War One? Because Japan was involved in World War One. They even went into China and helped to fight in the war over there. So the nation had a strong economy immediately after the war. Yes, it was annoyed and angered by the fact that it was ignored at the Treaty of Versailles, but they were making democratic reforms and economically everything was going fine. However, they were hit hard by the Great Depression in 1920. When the Great Depression hit, of course, we cover it in the United States history, but this is something that is global. And Japan relied on foreign trade as they were an island nation. And suddenly the value of Japanese exports dropped by 50% between 1929 and 1931. That is a crushing blow to any nation's economy. And so the military and the nationalists were angered when Japan agreed to keep its navy very small at the London Naval Conference in 1930. At least this could be something where you can have some jobs and build up your navy and build up your military. And this was something that was then used against the government of the time period for a military dictatorship then to take over. So Japan had an emperor and the military did not fully take him out of power. Why? Well, the people worshiped the emperor. State Shintoism was on the rise and the people fought in his name. At the time, um, with the start of World War II, it's going to be Emperor Hirohito. The military leader of Japan was and well is going to be General Hedekai Tojo. 
So what is Saint Shintoism? Uh, it's Neo Shintoism, and it's an it's an intensified form of Shintoism, which is kind of an animist religion, um, believing in spirits and entities having spirits. Um, and when you die, your spirit goes and rests there in a Shinto shrine location. Either way, with state Shintoism, it glorified the emperor and moved away from Western influences on society. Westerners were seen as greedy and individualistic, and a push for family uh, state, a push for the family state, was established and self-sacrifice. Traditional Japanese virtues were put in the forefront, and all of kind of this push to modernization that we had seen, starting with the Meiji Restoration, is kind of you know. It's, it's pick and choose now. What do you want? Yes, we want to build up our Navy. Yes, we want to build up our military. So we're going to continue to build up in those areas. But no, we are not going to be pulling in any cultural Western influential um, items anymore. So Japanese goals in the 1930s, they want to revive their economy. Of course, there's a Great Depression going on. Everybody wants to revive their economy. So they want to lead economic modernization in Asia, hoping that one day they can actually rival Europe and the United States. And they want to free Asia from a colonial influence. However, at the exact same time, they want to actually build up their own colonial empire, which they are going to be calling the East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. They've got a catchy name for it. Either way, it's an imperial concept created and propagated for occupied Asian populations during 1930 through 1945 by the Empire of Japan. And basically, what is it? Well, Japan wants to dominate Asia economically and militarily. That's the whole thing. It's colonies. That's what they want. Now, where are they going to get all the natural resources? Japan is an area that has a lot of mountains. It doesn't actually even have a lot of area for them to grow their own crops. That is why during the 220 years of isolation, they had to at least keep a port open because they need to purchase rice and other goods from China because simply they need these resources to keep their island going. So Japan, yeah, it has a severe lack of natural resources. However, nearby Manchuria has plenty of resources that they need. For example, coal, there's already built up industries there. They have ports. And so they want to move into this location. And since they already own and occupy Korea, Manchuria is just right across the border. So September, th September 1931, the Japanese army invaded. The Chinese protest to the League of Nations, but the League of Nations is not a strong international organization. And so what do they do? Nothing. Nothing. So they go on into Manchuria and they're able to take it over. Now, of course, Japan goes and has um, some, you know, reason, some story for the start of the invasion. They say that a bomb went off by some train tracks and that's why they had to go and start this fighting. Um, however, that's all just, you know, a story um, to basically say that it was okay for them to go in and invade the location. Um, if this dynamite that went off by a train track that starts this whole entire conflict would have been a real attack, it probably would have damaged the track. No, dynamite goes off and it doesn't even damage the track. Trains can still go on the track after the dynamite went off. So, you know, you can definitely call this Manchurian incident into question. Either way, Chiang Kai-shek is the leader of China right now. And a civil war is going on between Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong and the communists. And Chiang Kai-shek right now is going, you know what, we cannot beat the Japanese up in Manchuria. We have to still focus here on the communists in mainland China. Uh, we're just going to kind of give it up. However, uh, the warlord of Manchuria, Zhang, he doesn't want to just give it up. And he is constantly asking China to send up their full military forces to stop an invading nation from taking the territory. Either way, Japan is victorious and they take Manchuria and they then take the last emperor of the Qin Dynasty, Puyi, and put him in charge as a puppet empire or emperor. Um, Puyi um, was a child still when he lost his power and um, China went over to being a republic under Song Yat-sen. Um, and yeah, Puyi has kind of lived this life of kind of trying to figure out what to do now. Um, his wife, 
um, is going to be used and abused by the Japanese. They are going to get her very addicted to various drugs um, during this time that they are reigning, in quotes, in Manchuria. And she is going to die um, because of withdrawal symptoms when the war is over and she is put into prison for a period of time once the war was over over and she was arrested uh for collaborating with the japanese and yeah she died of withdrawals in her cell so they were definitely puppets of the japanese and we're not even seeing how they were being used and abused so japan goes in uh even reaching the great wall of china which of course at this period of time with the new war, war technology it's not going to be any big barrier but it's something for soldiers to basically just stop and take a picture at so from 1933 to 1936 the japanese continue to move on and conquer more land now how do the chinese react to this well they boycott japanese goods and they have their own kind of like a boston tea party but in shanghai harbor they take japanese cargo and they throw it overboard um, thus saying that they don't want these japanese goods anymore and they're going to formally boycott that now, many Chinese want to go to war with Japan to protect their land, but Chiang Kai-shek continues to focus on Mao Zedong and the communists because that threat is within their nation right there close to home while Japan is taking the far northern regions. So, yeah, that's a problem. However, the communists now are jumping on the bandwagon of going to war versus Japan, and they head up north because that's what they're doing anyway. Um, and they are saying, yes, let's go to war with Japan. And they eventually will also start follow, er, fighting the Japanese, which is going to allow them to get more followers as they are now seen as the ones going up against Imperial Japan. So 1936, um, Chiang Kai-shek goes to the north to go and negotiate with um, that warlord, um, Zhang, about the military heading up to the north and what do they do well they take chiang kai-shek prisoner and hold him hostage for yeah two weeks as they say we need the military to come up here a foreign power is invading you need to stop this so zhang negotiated with the communists and the russians and uh chiang is eventually going to be released when he sent troops to fight the japanese but by this point japan was moving into another province beyond manchuria because they basically taken over all of manchuria so it's a little bit too late here for this situation so we have now the second Sino war that is going to be started on july 7th 1937 we have an incident on the marco polo bridge some fighting happens who shoots first we don't necessarily know but we suspect that it is the japanese either way fighting happens it all breaks out and this war is of course going to last until the end of world war ii ending on september 2nd 1945. beijing and other northern cities as well as the capital Nanking, would fall to the japanese in 1937 and chiang kai-shek now goes and moves to a new capital city of chongqing uh, the Chinese guerrillas, led by China's communist leader Mao Zedong, continue to fight the Japanese in the conquered areas of the north, which again is helping him gain supporters for when the war is officially done in 1945. Here's just a quick photo after the fighting occurred on the Marco Polo Bridge and the Japanese had fully taken control of the bridge, the border between Japan and China. So the Battle of Shanghai. August 13th, 1937 through November 1937, Chiang Kai-shek felt that the Japanese were close to breaking and he put together a large force to attack and to remove the Japanese from Shanghai. The Japanese um, do not want to lose Shanghai, especially this is the place that went and dumped all of their goods. So when Chiang Kai-shek goes in and takes Shanghai, the Japanese come back in full vengeance with 200,000 troops to retake the city. They go and do massive bombing campaigns. And as you can tell to the left here, we have a baby all by um, itself crying after a bombing raid has just occurred. And Shanghai takes huge, heavy losses and Japan retakes the city. Here is a Japanese tank in the streets of Shanghai. 
So by 1938, there were 1 million Japanese troops in China, but by 1941, with 2 million troops in the area, they were still unable to take and conquer the entire country. And so Japan is trying to rethink, how can we take this entire country? We are not winning here the entire war. So out of basically the fear of losing, they adopted the three all campaign, kill all, burn all, destroy all. Basically, the Japanese realized they didn't have enough soldiers, and so fear will rule the day. If they go through and cause the Japanese people to truly fear them and to fear what they could do and will do based off of evidence, then maybe they will give up without a fight. By 1945, 4 million Chinese people will have died and 60 million will be displaced. However, those numbers can vary depending on what source you are going to be looking at. And many cities are going to lay in ruins. However, when we're thinking of that three all campaign, we can think of the city of Nanking because this is where we see it instituted in full mass. So on December 13th, 1937 through January 1938, Chiang Kai-shek knew that Japan was going to take Nanking, the capital of China at the time. He hoped to wear down the Japanese, but abandoned the city anyway. And the Japanese were not worn down, but continued to push more into China. When the Japanese took the city, they began to rape and pillage the city. 300,000 people of all ages are going to be massacred. Tens of thousands of women are going to be raped. Babies are going to be used as bayonet practice by throwing babies up in the air to see if they could then catch them on their bayonet, on their gun. Horrible atrocities are going to be happening throughout this. The Japanese general who went and initiated this after the war is going to be put on trial for his war crimes and he is going to be found guilty and executed however japan is going to go and take his remains and have him um interned in kind of their um shinto shrine that is for all of the great military heroes and this is something that is still just a stinger in china um, that this individual was found guilty of his crimes, did one of the worst atrocities that you can do, and then gets laid to rest um, in a place of honor. So this is something that is quite shocking still for the Chinese people that this has happened. So with the rape of Nanking, the soldiers uh, were just basically let loose around the city to basically wreak havoc, to kill at will, to rape at will, to do whatever they need to do to just strike fear in the heart of the Chinese people. Um, it is known as the Rape of Nanking because of the city itself, all of the people literally being taken and abused terribly. And now we have plenty of documentation of this event. Why the one, if you want to go and scare people uh, throughout China, you need to document and say, this is what is going to befall upon you if you do not give up. Also, people were sending home pictures, kind of like breaking postcards of what they were doing in China to go and show how honorable they were for the acts they were doing. And so this documentation is going to be of course used in trials after the war but it also is going to be showing all of the things that japan has gone and done including as in this images to the right burying people alive they just buried people alive so after 18 days they killed all of those people and now in Nanking, um, today, we do have the Massacre Memorial Hall, um, which has just this plaque that just kind of simply sums up everything by stating the Chinese people suffered greatly. So January 1938 through 1941, Japan started to experience their first defeats. They started to switch to a massive air campaign due to rising casualties, which they could not afford. The Chinese saw their chance and launched a massive offensive against Japan in the early months of 1940. This offensive failed, though, due to a lack of industry and skilled soldiers on the Chinese side. Yes, you might have more soldiers, 
but you need the proper training and tactics. From this point on, Chiang Kai-shek did not launch another major offensive against the Japanese and basically just waits and plays defense for the rest of the war. But Japan does continue to expand, but still the defense is working enough that, that all of China does not fall under the Japanese hands throughout the war. Um, now, the Japanese army rapidly advanced through other areas as well besides China. They go into Indochina, um, that would be like um, Vietnam, Malaya, and in Indonesia. Some Asian people welcomed them as liberators from Western imperialists like the French. Uh, however, soon they were generally feared as the new imperialists, not as Asian liberators, but just like another colonial power like Britain and France. They treated non-Japanese people with ruthlessness, cruelty, and severity. And so you are not going to win over the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese, of the Indonesians, if you are going to be governing them them with ruthlessness. And so pretty soon these nations figure out that Japan is just another colonial overlord. So September 1940, Japanese troops occupy northern Indochina and Japan goes and signs the um, pact with Germany and Italy forming, um, yeah, the three access powers. Now, President Roosevelt has gone now and made certain changes. He has moved our major military base from being in San Francisco out to being to Hawaii so that our Navy can better respond to incidences and to threats in the Pacific Ocean so they have less ocean to carry. However, um, Pearl Harbor is an area that is definitely more susceptible to attack than San Francisco. Um, also, President Roosevelt has to make a decision on whether or not is he going to cut off oil to Japan. The United States is the major oil supplier to Japan, and its Navy and its Army can't really go without oil, without fuel. However, finally, President Roosevelt does make the decision to cut off those oil supplies and put that embargo on Japan, which is why Japan then goes and launches its attack on Pearl Harbor. So back on December 6, 1941, President Roosevelt addresses a personal appeal for peace to Emperor Hirohito, but <laughs> the plan is already in motion. And on December 7, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, invaded Siam, Hong Kong, Burma, North Borneo, the Philippines, and various Pacific Islands. Soon after, Britain and the United States will declare war on Japan. And of course, I will be going more in depth on the Pearl Harbor attack with the World War II in the Pacific PowerPoint presentation. So from this point on, Japan is going to be building its empire um, however, the United States is also now going to be building itself back up after the attack on um, Pearl Harbor and going and facing the Japanese and turning the war around uh, with the war versus the Japanese at the Battle of Midway, which happened six months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. So this has been Militarism in Japan. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any comments, please leave them below. Thank you very much.